chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham to Isaac, and to Jacob. The New Testament reading comes from Matthew, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Thanks for the word of the Lord. It is, as I always say, good for Ann and I to drive over the two bridges and come to be with you all in Fox Island. And more and more of you are familiar faces, faces of friends, and then some old and dear, not old in age, but in length of relationship, <laughs> dear friends uh, sitting over, um, oddly enough, to my, to my right. Uh, that is not a political or theological statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's um, it's just great uh, to be to be with you. Uh, my sermon I'm, is sort of informed by the Matthew text. Um, kind of wanders a little more for me than I usually do, um, but I'll just have to trust that you'll stay with me and sort of love me anyway. Um, I want to start with this personal reflection that came on me this week, um, and I want to start by talking for a little bit about, much to everybody's surprise, Jesus. Um, like some of you here, I think, um, you grew up with an image of Jesus as a gentle white man with a smile, often carrying a, a lamb, he had blue eyes in some of the pictures um, and long flowing hair that kind of made him look like a member of Led Zeppelin. <laughs> uh, this uh, particular image of Jesus, as some of you know, was captured in a, a very famous painting 
uh, called uh, cleverly the Head of Christ uh, by the American artist Warner Salmon, who lived from 1892 to 1968. Now, devotional art like that painting, which I'm sure you know, um, is part of a long tradition of, of artists and, and communities creating right images of Jesus in their own image, ig ignoring uh, what we know or what we don't know about the historical Jesus. What we know is that he was a, a Jewish man, he was a person of color whose appearance really isn't described anywhere um, in the Bible, which is why I've always assumed that he's five foot five. Um, <laughs> My childhood image of Jesus, I am going somewhere uh, with this. Uh, my childhood image of Jesus as white, gentle, and mild came home to me um, early this week, uh, shortly after All Saints Day. Um, I can't tell you how much it meant uh, with this community when I knew that you were reading the names of saints and I was able to share the name of my mother, uh, the name of my dear friend, uh, Karen Wilson Sims, for you to read on All Saints Day. That, that's a meaningful day for me, has always been a meaningful day in my, in my ministry. And so I came home, uh, we were visiting Anne's, uh, Anne's favorite sister, which nobody should ever hear me say that, um, in Santa Fe. Um, and I was going through a box of things um, and uh, I found uh, two funeral cards. Uh, one from my beloved mother who died in 1965 when I was 15 and from Grandma Feldner, my mother's mother, who was a saint to me and died in 90, 1999 at the age of 201. Um, 101. <laughs> she only feels to me like she lived 200 years. Both had the image of the white, gentle Jesus. My mom's, he's carrying a sheep. Grandma is the painting by Solomon. And these are precious to me. They're little reminders of people that were saints in my life that mean the world to me. Um, sometimes I can barely say my mom's name without wanting to cry. So the first point of my sermon is what do I do with the whiteness of the image of Jesus portrayed on these cards? As a pastor, theologian, I believe it is very important to Remember accurately the cultural context of the historical Jesus and the damage done by taking him out of that context. The case could be made, and it has been made, that Solomon's painting of Jesus fed a white supremacy in this country. The way Jesus is portrayed on my mom and grandma's funeral card is likely to make some folks really angry. And I found myself stop, stopping and say, before we get angry at the past, which I think we tend to do a lot these days, it might be good to take a breath and to pause our anger and remember that the image on these cards and in our imagination was not an overt political statement, but rather a simple attempt to offer comfort to those grieving, those experiencing loss. It feels clear to me as I get to the end of this first part of the sermon. It feels clear to me that within the Christian household when thinking about Jesus, people imagine Jesus in a way that suits their particular need at the moment. And I think that's okay. When lost in grief, when your heart is breaking, you remember Jesus as a kind, loving shepherd holding you close. When engaged in the hard struggle for social change, the revolutionary struggle for social change, you remember Jesus in a way of being a revolutionary speaker challenging powers and principalities. We met also when we think of Jesus, we remember him in a way we can identify with. The secret, I think, is to not absolutize one image of Jesus 
and to hold space in our spiritual life for a faith, for a spirituality that offers both, right? The comfort of the shepherd and the solidarity of the revolutionary involved in social change. As far as the historically inaccurate portrait of Jesus on Phyllis Telka Feldner's funeral card, I'm grateful that this card may have given comfort to my family when their heart was break breaking. And I don't feel a terrible need to apologize for that comfort. It would be a very interesting exercise, and I would be willing to do it with a bunch of folks, maybe a bunch of folks going to some island somewhere, <laughs> for us to collect a whole bunch of pictures of Jesus in art, and then to go and select the one that speaks to us in this time and journal about it or think about it. Anyway, that's the beginning of this, this sermon. In the first place, my brain went and... Now we'll move a little closer to the Matthew passage uh, for the next part. Please pray with me. Gracious God within whom we live and move and have our being. Focus our hearts and our minds on your word to us this morning. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. Amen. I don't think I've ever preached in 40 years with my mom's obituary looking at me from the pulpit. <laughs> I hope I'm not embarrassing you, Mom. In today's passage from Matthew, we meet a Jesus who seems in radically stark contrast to the Jesus on these memorial cards that I shared with you earlier. In the text, Jesus doesn't mince words, right? He's not polite, nor is he deferential. He is clear, he is bold, and he is confrontational. As he denounces religious leaders who, quote, tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others. Jesus has absolutely no patience with religious leaders who talk the talk but do not walk the walk. Religious leaders who say one thing to their followers, but go off and do their own thing for themselves. The religious leaders in Jesus' time, certain religious leaders, have gone astray from the core teaching of their tradition. Love for God, love for neighbor, love for self. In this passage, Jesus reminds his followers then and now that pious words and orthodox convictions don't make a person faithful. Faith is about who and what you trust, period. It is about the orientation of one's heart and the way one strives to live a life grounded in love. So as we come to this table this morning, it is my sense that there are aspects today of the Christian community that are not terribly unlike the people Jesus was talking to in this passage. More about that in a second. As I looked at this passage, I became aware of two different ways it could be misleading, and I want to make sure that we note that. First, some may hear what was just read as Jesus' critique of all religion. People who read the passage this way see religion as a set of rules and rituals put in place by hypocrites who are more interested in their own power 
than in the people's well-being. We don't have to look far to see examples of this. Christian leaders who delight in drawing close to political power for its own end. Leaders who choose political prestige over the real teachings of Jesus. Love for neighbor, welcoming the stranger. It's easy for somebody to read this passage from Matthew and see in it a critique of all religion. Religion's bad. It's going to be the death of us. I wrote a big piece for the old Seattle PI on will religion be the death of us. I understand it, and we see it in the statistics, in the religious trends of the country. But with that said, I don't believe Jesus is attacking religion here. His whole life was shaped by religion. By religious rituals, Judaism gave him his vocabulary. Jesus was a devout religious man. Religion can not be a burden that can give us rituals, narratives, values, and rhythms that nourish our spiritual life. Second, some read this passage and interpret it as Jesus' condemnation of Judaism as he seeks to create a new religion as an alternative to Judaism. This passage has been used to cultivate anti-Semitic sentiment. Friends, I don't believe this is an attack on Judaism. I don't believe Jesus set out to start a new religion. That's nonsense. He was a devout Jew through and through. He had a lover's quarrel with his faith. That's what we see in this passage. Like many Jewish people then and now, he was arguing about practice and interpretation. He criticized certain ideas within his faith. He expanded sacred texts with new understandings. But he lived and died a Jewish man. We have to remember that. And Christians like to forget it. Matthew 23, 1 to 12 is neither an attack on religion or a rejection of Judaism. We get to the last movement of the sermon. Fox Island friends, in our text, Jesus calls out religious leaders that have lost their way. Leaders that talk the talk but don't walk the walk. Behind his words I hear in Jesus a desire for those who heard him then and those who hear him now to find their way back to a faith grounded in love of God, love of neighbor, love of self, and making that love flesh in the world. We need to hear those words today. Because in the church, and in the lives of those go to church, it is, who go to church, it is easy to forget what is the center of it all. That love. That sense of the mystery in the middle of it all. We forget, Jesus calls us back and asks us to remember. The Pharisees didn't practice what they preached. Jesus called them out on their hypocrisy. In many, many in 2023, inside and outside the church, see hypocrisy in the church and in Christian leaders. Some of this has come to light even in some recent political events in Washington, D.C., I believe there is a longing for change and reform in the church today. The unchurched may be seeking communities that stop talking politics and choose to practice the gospel of love and grace grounded in the way of Jesus. Jesus called out the Pharisees for not practicing what they preach And it's easy for us to say, amen, I love it when he goes after those religious leaders. 
but it gets a bit harder when we look in the mirror and recognize that pointing out the hypocrisy of the church and in other communities and in other people makes it eventually very clear that there's hypocrisy in our lives as well. Because even in this great community, we don't always practice what we preach. I don't practice always what I preach. When we point to the brokenness of others, it isn't too long before we come and face the brokenness in ourselves. We may try to ignore it, but the time comes when we can't ignore it anymore. The finger Jesus pointed at the scribes and Pharisees is also pointing at me and you. I close. Friends, we need to recognize that we also are not perfect. And we need to recognize our own brokenness and hypocrisy. This does not mean that we can't be about the work of reformation and renewal in the Christian community, of justice and kindness in the world. We must be about that work. What it does mean is we do it we approach our lives and the work we do aware of our limits, aware that we're not perfect, aware that we tend to be broken as well, that all of us go astray, not just the folks in that church across the street. We fail, all of us at times, to remember that love, but we continue the journey. We continue the journey because we are surrounded by the mystery and the grace of God. Not dependent on our perfection, but because the mystery of God's amazing grace is here for us. Because we are forgiven as we journey. Amazing grace, how sweet that sound. In the words of the poem that is our prayer of gratitude, that love that sustains us, like the air sustains the hawk and the water bears the swimmer. We are all at times hypocrites. Aware of our brokenness, we hold hands together and work grounded in love to renew the church and to love the people made in God's image, which is everyone. In Jesus' name, come to the table and be nourished for the journey. Amen.